KFYO, good morning. It's 738. Tom and Laura, this is Lubbock's First News. Uh, good morning and welcome back to the saddle. Randy Nagabauer, District 19. How are you, man? Where you been? I'm good, Tom. Laura, how are y'all? Good. Glad to have you back on the air. Well, it's good to be back. You know, it was uh, kind of a interesting seven weeks. We took off, uh, you know, the two weeks earlier, you know, so members could go to uh, the conventions, and then we had our normal uh, time a uh, month of August. And, uh, you know, the Nagabowers were kind of doing a lot of different things during that. We've been working on uh, archiving our papers that we're going to give to Texas Tech to spend a little time in the district. And then I'm proud to say uh, we spent some time with our grandkids uh, during the month of August, something we hadn't had an opportunity to do uh, in a while. So it was, it was kind of a mixed mm-hmm. bag of things we did in August. You were busy. We were busy, absolutely. So and now th- this morning, I'm trying to decide whether I'm deplorable or not. I'm trying to figure <laughs> out which, cate- which category I, I uh, fall into. I don't know if y'all kind of give that any consideration or not. Well, I, I mean, you mean? <clears throat> are you telling me that you're in the, the, the you're in the fifty percent of Americans that sit in the deplorable basket? I must be, Tom. I think she was probably putting me in that basket. I don't know that she hasn't told me that directly, but I have a feeling I was uh, one of the people that she was talking about in that basket. Okay. Uh, since you brought it up, what what do you make of this? I mean, I, you know, health is always an issue of a president in presidential candidates and stuff like that. But, you know, the do you think the rigorous nature of the schedule, I mean, do you think there's more to come on this, or do you think this is just a blow-by thing? Well, I think we'll, we'll wait and see. I, I will say this. That, you know, campaigning is intense, and, and campaigning for president is very intense. And, you know, you're scheduled very tightly. A lot of these schedules are put together way in advance. And so if you start having a little bit of a cold or a health issue or something like that, there's always this, you know, inclination just to keep pushing on. Uh, and sometimes that can be detrimental. So I know a lot of uh, people have called attention to the fact that she's been coughing, and now she had this episode yesterday uh, at the at the 9-11 memorial. And so well, we'll see. I think certainly if there are serious health issues here, uh, you know, I think the, 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 the American people, you know, should have access to that information because, you know, we, we need a healthy commander-in-chief. Well, uh, this is interesting. Donald Trump said that, you know, he just had a physical and that that he's going to release his report and hopefully his numbers are going to be good. But, you know, you would think that, you know, now that he said that he will and he is, I mean, hell or high water, he's probably going to release the numbers. But, you know, I, I think in general, uh, people want to know about the health of, you know, a presidential candidate. Yeah, I think so, too. And I think what's going to be kind of tricky here for Trump is that he won't release his tax returns yet. Uh, She's released her tax returns, and now he's calling on her to release her health records. Uh, And, uh, you know, he said he'll do. So I think think that'll be a – it could be a slippery slope for him. But I do think it's – I think it is important information. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to hit a break, but I want to. I wanted to ask you about uh, people inside the party and you know the way that uh, they're supporting Donald Trump, and if it's just something that people are going along with because uh, because nobody anticipated that Donald Trump would be here, you know, eleven, twelve, thirteen months ago. Nobody. Nobody anticipated that. No. And, uh, you know, I think everybody's trying to kind of get their arms around that. I think they, the, the thing that they get their arms around most is that uh, they don't want Hillary Clinton. Uh, and so they're warming up to the fact that if you don't support Donald Trump, then you're really going to be supporting Hillary Clinton. So within the party, you've seen some members that have openly embraced Trump. Others that have said, you know, use the term, I'm going to support the nominee. Others are just kind of running their own campaign and, and staying away from, you know, the presidential uh, uh, endorsement. Or uh, So it's, there's a lot of different different ways people are approaching that right now. All right. Uh, in conversation with Randy Nagerbauer, back after a seven-week congressional recess, 742. Good morning.
Good morning. Right now, 747 in conversation with Congressman Randy Nagabauer. Welcome back to the program, and good morning. Hello. It's good to be back. Yes. All right. Uh, man, you've been gone a little bit too long. Slow on the uptake there. But that's all right. <laughs> hey, uh, all right. We were talking about the attitudes of people in Congress, you know, relative like Republicans and the support of Donald Trump, because a lot of people, like we said, it was unexpected that he would be here. And most people just didn't take him for serious that, you know, he could possibly even, even considering the fact that he could end up as the nominee. I mean, it was just not even considered a possibility. So, you know, now you have people that, you know, are, had, were one of the other candidates, you know, one of the other 16, some, you know, still dragging their feet. Others sit there and say, yes, I'm in. I'm going to support Donald. Others say, well, I gave my word. I said I would support the nominee, so here I am. Um, One of the things that that Donald Trump has said that he wanted to beef up the military, and some of the estimates are, you know, like $80 billion per year, to increase the forces, and a lot of people are saying, and I'm all for increasing the military and being stronger. I get it. However, you know, is this one of those situations where you were thinking, as a conservative, okay, if we're going to spend eighty here, where are we going to cut back eighty somewhere else? Or at what point do you sit there and say, look, we're going to have to increase spending because? I, you know, I know that's a conservative platform. You know, y- you want to cut spending. You want to cut spending. You want to conserve. You want to conserve. You want to conserve. I get that. But at what point do you, uh, you know, do we just bite the bullet and say, hey, you know what? We're going to have to spend more money if we do this. Yeah, well, Tom, that's a very good question. And I think what I think needs to be done, all of this discussion needs to be done in the context of our total spending. I mean, we're spending, we're going to have over four point. I think $4.1 trillion that we're going to spend uh, for for next year. The question is, how do you spend that money? And one of the things that we know is that uh, we have kind of kept uh, discretionary spending. Uh, that's the spending that we actually get to vote on relatively flat over the last three or four or five years. But what's been increasing exponentially is, is the, the, the spending that's on autopilot. So when you start talking about we need to – beef up our defense spending. What we also need to do is go over and look at in our entitlement spending on Medicare and Medicaid and some of these other programs that are on autopilot, uh, food stamps, and all of those kind of programs, and reprioritize uh, how we spend American taxpayers' money. And certainly, I think, making sure we have strong national defense. I mean, that's one of our number one constitutional responsibilities. Military uh, and spending I think a lot is... Of at fifty four percent, so most of what we spend is military. Is are, are you suggesting more than fifty four percent is from necessary a, from, a, from a from a discretionary standpoint? But but what you have to understand at the same time, Laura, is that we've been actually reducing uh, the number of personnel in the military, and we have some very old uh, uh, equipment that we've been using. We're still flying B fifty twos. We have that now. The third generation of family members flying uh, B fifty two. I had a B fifty two bomber model when I was a kid. Yeah, so I think I think what we have to do is not it's not so much how and not always how much we spend uh, in a certain category. I think, in, for, for example, in defense, there I think there's room for some reprioritization of how we spend money and in sustaining some of these old weapon systems uh, because it's, you know, that base is in my district or that is being manufactured in my district. I think we have to get past that and start really kind of saying, what does it take to keep America secure? Because what it took to secure America in previous years is not the same as it is today. We're fighting a much different war than we've passed than we've fought, you know, traditionally in the past. In conversation with Randy Nagarro, we'll be back. Uh, if you have a question or comment, ring us up, 770-5790-752. Good morning. 
Good morning. In conversation with Congressman Randy Nagerbauer, this is Lubbock's First News. Go to the phone, 770-5790. Everett, you're on. What's up? Well, I was just wondering, you were talking about the cost of uh, the expansion of the building up of the military, and I, I keep looking at the cost of keeping all of the unemployment that we have out there. And surely there ought to be a way to take some of those unemployed people and use them in some capacity in the military, and it would take them off one roll and put them on another and possibly use them in uh, jobs that could help defense contractors fulfill some of those requirements. I'll hang up and listen to what you all say. Thanks. All right. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a good I think one of one of the things that we've been talking about is, as I said, we've had we've had a drawdown really of our military, and so we've been basically uh, reducing the number of people that are in the military. So if you're going to ramp back up the military, get those army numbers back up, uh, and so forth, then you're going to create some opportunities for people uh, to to join the military. But I think the other point that the listener is making is is that. We've got to change our way our entitlement programs work today. Today, we encourage people not to work, and we've got to change our entitlement programs around to where there's a motivation to work, whether that's unemployment insurance, whether that's food stamps, whether that's housing assistance, uh, taking what we've been spending just to maintain those people and take, a, uh, and take that money and integrate them into the workforce, and whether it's the military or the private workforce. I noticed there was an interesting statistic last week that said the number of job openings has increased, but the number of people taking those jobs didn't increase proportionately. So that means that we've got job openings out there, but we've got we don't have people uh, filling those jobs. And so there's something wrong with a system where we've got an economy that's creating a few new job opportunities, and yet we don't have people taking advantage of those. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Last week we were uh, looking at some information that said that there was a shortage of like entry level workers, like fast food fast food restaurants were like really hurting. And you know, the- well, and, yeah, and I think part of that is all of this movement to increase you know the minimum wage, and so what you see a lot of the restaurants and uh, uh, companies that had. Uh, created opportunities for entry-level workers, they've had to curtail those because the cost of adding those to the payroll now has increased in many places where they've instituted the, the uh, increased uh, minimum wage. Okay, uh, Randy. It's jobs that are hard to support a family on. Well, they are, but what, what we have to understand is that most people that were on minimum wage last year aren't on minimum wage this year. I mean, there's you, you've got to create value in yourself. And so you, you get an opportunity. You may go in at a lower wage, but you work hard. You learn some skills. You, you show some initiative. We're out of time.